Thank you very much, Adam. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for tuning in. I'm coming to you from Long Island in New York. Um, it's, it's been quite a, an, an amazing several weeks here, but I'm happy to report things are improving dramatically day, day by day, and we're in active recovery mode. Um, that means a lot of different things for folks like me doing analytics than it does for the, the first responders who are maybe getting a breather for the first time. Um, so I'm excited to kind of tell you a little bit about our journey. And what I'm going to cover with you today is not intended to be prescriptive for, for every organization, but it, it's certainly what's, what seems to be working in, in our current uh, environment and the dynamics in, in our large health system. So very quickly, there's just a few facts about the organization so you get a sense of what our organization size is and in the, the geographic location that we operate in. Um, we are a very large integrated network, um, more so than, than what I've seen uh, traditionally prior to coming to New York, where we do offer a variety of services, but not necessarily redundancy in close proximity. We really manage and coordinate across our, our health system uh, very effectively. Again, this kind of gives you a sense of the, the layout. We've got about 23 hospitals uh, spread out across Long Island and Manhattan and New York with some other affiliations as you can see on this, this map. Uh, the numbers here are rapidly approaching about 800 outpatient facilities. They're adding adding them at a rapid clip over the last few years, so you know, we'll see what the dynamics look like um, as we continue to learn lessons from the, the recent pandemic. And now I'm just gonna step over into a poll, our first poll question. Um, it's really interesting to, for me to, to understand, you know, what kind of organizational um, decisions are being made, and maybe I can tailor some of the content uh, that we cover this afternoon. So, first question is: Does your organization have a CD, CDO, a CAO, or a CBAO? I'd like you to go ahead and answer that if you could. Let's give it a few more seconds and proceed. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So Honestly, my role at Northwell Health has only really become recognized uh, at the level that it is in, in the last several months, uh, probably the latter part of last year. Um, so not surprising that only 20% of folks are they're attending today or are in organizations that have that, that role of function established. But let's go into a little bit about our journey. Um, if you're doing analytics in the healthcare space and have a uh, responsibility for overseeing uh, any chunk of the, the business, you probably have very similar models. This, uh, it's, it's, it's simply the, the matrix that we all see every time uh, the organization grows or we're or, or adding new functionality and new capability. From an analytics perspective, we have to be able to integrate these disparate data types to provide the types of analytics that are, that are needed to support the business. So. Just to help you understand what the mandate is for, for my team in particular, uh, we have very large population centers here that we're, that we're supporting, uh, as you already saw in some of the previous slides. So the databases and the scale of the data that we're managing on a daily basis is very, very large. So we, we've got a, a, a team of people that manage over 700 uh, databases, and I think we're over like 1,200 servers now inside of our environments. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of data movement, as you can see, it's 4.7 billion updates across the layers in the data warehousing environment. Uh, that number was as of probably three or four months ago, and the data sets continue to grow exponentially for us, just like they do for everyone else. 
then what I'll talk about a little bit in the presentation is kind of indicated here, we're enabling business units to advance capabilities. And what I mean by this is for us to be able to effectively support all the functions in the health system, we need to enable the business units to support their areas of discipline uh, as they're closest to the, the front lines uh, in their respective verticals. Our, our role is really providing framework and infrastructure and expertise to help them to deploy things at scale and, and make sure that we're, we're uh, monitoring performance, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about some of the key strategies that we did, we've done. Again, this is what's worked for us. One of the things that we found early on was that uh, the technologists were struggling with clinical content to deliver meaningful outputs. Uh, so the organization made some, some decisions early to organize and co-locate technical people with clinical staff. Uh, in fact, I have a physician-led team that's embedded with my group that is really responsible for driving delivery of clinical content. They're also very strategic, and we're applying the strategy in a number of ways, but it really has been invaluable to us as we try to keep clinical focus on everything that we do. So we really are focused on the value that we can provide as opposed to answering the questions that people just may have curiosities about or you know, trying to just focus honestly on if we can answer the question, is it enabling a decision to be made differently? And we really, how are we going to measure the impact of it? Um, we, additionally, we're, we're leveraging organizational structure and, and technology to facilitate collaboration. Uh, this is more so true now than ever before, I'm sure, as you're in, interacting with this particular platform for today's webinar, you're saying that technology is unbelievably powerful. We're using it in a lot of ways now, in ways that we hadn't thought of what we would have to do at this level, uh, and simply integrating analytics into our, our web broadcast and things of that nature. I mean, it's, it's just a, an amazing acceleration of the transformation that we're experiencing. So then the other strategies, I think, are probably some things that some, that some of you have been engaged in. Um, meeting with the executive team, really to understand organizational priorities, to set an agenda deliberately, as opposed to staying in, in reactive mode and handling all the requests that we get. And sometimes people are just looking for everything. If you ask them what they want, they'll say everything. Um, I don't think that we're necessarily that different, but we try to bring uh, the organizational strategy um, forward as a lens to then look at each of the areas of discipline and the business units to figure out with their help, you know, what are their, what are the business priorities that are, that are in the near future that we should be aware of and how do we enable them? And this helps us to develop an enterprise roadmap that we continue to refresh, obviously, as things change, a pandemic occurs, uh, unfortunately, something like this, it causes us to readjust on the fly sometimes. Um, a couple of other you know, really significant things that we had to do when I arrived, we didn't have a, really a full-blown data warehouse. So we had to go through a process to make a decision on implementing that. While we're implementing it, we also saw that we needed to really do some work to enable the business units around the health system to continue to advance their analytic capabilities and give them better access to data. Uh, not sure how it is for all of you, but um, that's I've been hearing getting access to data has been problematic for the last, I don't know, probably 20 years or so, as I have worked in the healthcare space in different organizations. Just briefly, a little bit of how we're structured. Again, this is what, what's working well for us. Um, feel free to copy or, or laugh at me. <laughs> I, I, I completely understand. Uh, there's a lot of ways to, to make this work. It just This just happens to be how we're, we're operating. You'll notice the database administration uh, and this analytic resource center uh, and data governance are, are also part of uh, the, my purview. I have people really focused on these efforts inside of my team. And then the underpinning is really the, the clinical data strategy team that, that helps us to drive the, the meaningful outputs that are really having an impact on the organization. So then we want to talk a little bit about uh, self-service because we were talking about uh, data governance from a traditional standpoint and you know from the perspective that we've had over the last several years um, it tends to be something that people associate with an academic exercise or control or um, that there's a, a fear that it causes uh, a lot of chaos and, and uh, misuse of data but we really had to weigh that out and look at what are the what are the things that we can leverage self-service to help in that space, and we found that you know, if we're providing uh, capabilities to do self-service, it gives us the ability to also build 
enterprise sanctioned data sources and data structures and models to give people the, the level of access that they need without making it uh, challenging in the sense that they're fishing out of the ocean. They're really able to get at really the heart of the data sets that they're needing to answer the business questions that they have. So these are some of the, the drivers. Uh, I think you're probably experiencing some of these as well. One of the, the drivers that made us make the decision is some of the vendors in the space are uh, quite creative and make free trial versions of their software available to folks. So whether we're ready for, to sanction it or not, it was already happening in the health system. So we made a decision to just jump into it with, with both feet really to help support the business. And as you guys are probably quite keenly aware, there's a lot of limitations when you try to centralize enterprise teams, even if you're a small organization, there's multiple dis disciplines within that. So it gets a little dicey when you're trying to support all of them and be all things to all people with regard to supporting them with effective analytics. Then there's, there's also a significant cost of benefits um, from using a self-service type of the platform because the traditional BI tools are a bit on the expensive side in terms of you know, providing the skill sets to to really work within them. It's, things are improving over time, of course, but but it's been certainly liberating for uh, the analytics teams not to have to go to school and get a certification to be able to do data visualization, uh, not to undervalue the, the work of doing great data visualization. I think that's a, that's a skill unto itself uh, with re without regard to even the technology, knowing how to visualize and what's important information is, is a skill that uh, I know that we're really trying to refine in with, with my own teams. And we're trying to make sure that we're providing uh, good opportunities for, for learning and uh, technique. Uh, a lot of these other points, I'm sure, are, are quite quite self-evident. The increased demand for analytics is, is absolutely uh, a factor that we have to consider, particularly in a time that we're, that we're in, like we're in right now, where there's a massive, massive demand for data. And we've got to enable as many people as possible in order to be successful. So I'm just going to jump ahead to our next poll question. This is one that you know I've experienced a little bit of each of these different scenarios. So I'm just curious as to, to what your your experiences are. The question is, what is the most significant barrier to advancing analytics in your organization? Is it executive buy-in, insufficient funding, or silos within your business units? If you just take a second and answer that for me, I'd appreciate that very much. Okay, let's have a look and see what, what the results are. Wow, very interesting. As I said, in different parts of my my career in doing healthcare analytics, I've, I've seen and experienced all of these. Uh, yeah, <laughs> everyone wants to know ROI before we can you know, put the technology in place. And, I always say it's a chicken and egg scenario. I don't know what I don't know. So until I have the capability to measure it, I really can't tell you necessarily the value proposition. I, I'm sure you all are experiencing you know, similar challenges. So let's talk a little bit about you know, why we chose a, a centralized platform. Um, it, it's, it's pretty simple, you know, based on what we just talked about with regard to where the challenges were. Um, this is a sell point for, in 
part of what I use to communicate to our leadership team. Information security is, is a growing concern. So the provisioning process is, is a bit arduous, um, particularly in a large organization. I, I'm sure that um, everyone has some level of review process when you're implementing software. Um, we're always having to monitor this and our CISO is, is unbelievably sharp and her team does a, a great job for us. And I'm so grateful that someone else worries about this <laughs> because it, it's, it's just something we always are, are challenged with. This also gives us visibility into the analytic priorities of the organization. And what I mean by that is we provide different levels of support. We host the, the environment for folks. So we have a, an enterprise platform where if, if people want to buy licenses or they want us to procure them, um, we set them up right away inside of an enterprise environment. We're handling the burden of, of the provisioning process. We've done it once for the enterprise. It keeps that burden from being propagated repeatedly every time someone wants to to basically create data visualizations even uh, on a small scale for the department. Uh, they would have to go through that process to install it on separate uh, hardware. So we, we manage that centrally is, you know, for that reason. But the, the big benefit is because our system administrator is, is administering it and it's partnered and lives within our analytic resource center, which I'll highlight uh, in a couple of minutes, um, it, it really helps us to understand what the needs of the organization are and you know how do we best um, sequence the, the, the roadmap in, in terms of what data sources we need to bring in and help to build enterprise level data models to more effectively support uh, the business needs of the, of the organization. Again, back to the concept of the analytic resource center, this gives us a, an easier way to enable facilitation and coordination, coordination of, of efforts um, where there's common analytic goals within different business units informs the data warehouse roadmap, as I said. And the other aspects of it are system administration, license management, and things of that, things of that nature are much more difficult um, if they're decentralized. This gives us an easy way to be able to monitor that and provide it as a service within the organization. Um, keys to success, this really helps us to identify the priorities for data access, build subject area focus, focus smarts, those are things that we really were, were, were concerned about early on. That's why having the the, the, the workflow for um, enabling self-service at the same time we were building the infrastructure of the data warehouse uh, really was a, a key to being, being effective there and really supporting the organization. To limit the, the burden of access provisioning, identifying the, the business leader with organizational knowledge, this is probably one of the more um, the important steps that we took, um, very valuable in that we had someone who understood the the operational areas within the organization and understood everything from that perspective as opposed to from IT or even from clinical perspective. And they really facilitate and coordinate the activities um, across multiple business units and verticals. So to make this effective using self-service, we put in some, some governance framework. Current, you know, the content review standards, reviewing, you know, processes for publishing content. And probably one of the most valuable things that's been important is, is branding. And what I mean by that is really simply to make sure that as, as people are using these enterprise standard tools, that, that they're actually branding it in a way that it, it, when an executive is seeing some, some of this output, they know where it's coming from. Uh, it, it allows for transparency and communication, and it keeps us from having to constantly be chasing down uh, the answers to questions that we don't know the answers to because we didn't actually publish that through the part of the organization that I lead. It was really done in the business unit. Um, but it also promotes the, the, the work for the, the different analytic teams in the health system. And again, this is the whole concept of Analytic Resource Center. This is a web portal that we designed but this is really designed as a service to the organization. We framed it as and uh, positioned it that way so that the organization um, understood that we're not a group that's trying to take over and govern the world and you know be everything to everyone. We're here as a resource and whatever level of support you need, that's what we're here to do. So if you need uh, support for data architecture, database management, you know, the app, the, the good data visualization, even governance or things of that nature, we'll adjust our service offering based on what you need. 
Um, and it's very non-threatening and it's, it's actually been empowering because the collaboration levels that it, it's enabling are causing multiple groups in the health system to advance their capabilities. They're producing much better, more meaningful analytics that are really driving decision-making at unprecedented levels. These are just examples, so I'm gonna kind of blow through these a little bit because I wanna get you, show you a couple more interesting things before we get to Q&A. Um, one thing I'll, I'll note, we've got, in addition to a, a user forum, we've also put our ticketing stats uh, in, into this site so that there's transparency and visibility into our work queues so that folks can understand when they submit something, where exactly it's at within our queues and what, what, what kind of timeline are we talking about before they get delivery of what they've asked for. A couple of quick examples here. Um, some of these were done by the business units that we support. Uh, we provided the framework infrastructure and helped them design the data models, but they did their own data visualization. So this is an example of what's been looked at from patient survey information. Um, emergency services in our group is unbelievably mature. Uh, they do the real-time analytics. This is actually based off of the data model that we built with them so that they can actually monitor uh, the the patient movement and throughput and a number of different measures across all of the ERs and our health system. Um, great utilization for marketing, integrating uh, the data about uh, the services that uh, patients might be likely to, to need within the health system, doing some geo, geo, geospatial uh, mapping for them to, to help see where there's some opportunities. It's integrating a number of different data points. And again, just high level diagram. This is kind of showing you conceptually how we build our models. So we build these high level structures inside of the, the data warehouse that enable uh, combinations of these different uh, data structures like patient data and the attributes of a patient, combining that with clinical orders or, or whatever the, the specific type of the analytic that's needed. We can combine it, any number of these things to be able to generate that. So. Infection control is obviously a, a really important part that we have right now. See broader use than most anything else that we have. Um, but the critical aspects of what we do is we really create very large frame, frames in order to enable uh, multiple uh, use cases for, for analytics within the health system. So this is an example built on an enterprise pharmacy model. Um, we monitor prescribing trends. This also has another view that we generated to help uh, support monitoring of during the opioid crisis. Uh, similarly, we did the same thing for quality measures. Uh, provider scorecard, this is, takes things to a whole nother level when we have multiple domains and models that are uh, built effectively. We can hook those things together and create uh, scorecards for physicians that show them multiple different types of measures from different source systems, but we can bring them together and, and give them some, some abilities to see them in, in efficient formats. So it's a couple of other slices of that. Again, where we can put different lenses on it, uh, but multiple things that we can do from the, the same data structures. Um, clinical nursing rounding tools is something that we, did, we developed to really accelerate the work that uh, is done during the process of, of um, during rounds, if you've been in a hospital or visited family members, this is part of the, the clinical work that gets done. They actually go through the wards and they they try to identify what are the remaining items that need to be done for people who discharge effectively and efficiently. This gives them a view across the, every ward in the hospital, in every unit, and it lets them know who has things that are outstanding that are, uh, if we can address them quickly, they'll be able to go home obviously impacts patient satisfaction and length of stay. So that's an interesting interesting one. And the last couple I'm going to show you, these are really related to uh, responses for a couple of different major disruptions. This was from Hurricane Sandy. Um, across the health system, we, we needed to understand the transportation requirements, transportation assistance requirements, rather, uh, of everyone who was in one, any of our facilities so that we could enable the efficient uh, movement of those patients and evacuating them to more you know, secure and safe locations. Uh, these types of events, uh, similar to COVID, uh, they're really transformative in, in terms of the way we do things. And we're learning a lot right now that I think will change the types of analytics that we deliver uh, over the coming months. 
and this is just another example of what we did with the COVID uh, tracking for our internal um, activities. Um, so looking at patients that are under investigation for suspicion of COVID um, that are resident in our facilities, uh, it gives us a number of different you know, key pieces of data that we normally would not have thought of um, when we're just monitoring uh, occupancy and capacity. Uh, but you know, these were views that we were, able to, we were able to build because we just built rapidly some data models that were focused on the conditions that help us to understand what's happening in this population. So uh, looking for you know, pulmonary uh, types of symptoms, looking for flu-like symptoms, um, of course, testing results uh, for, from our lab systems as well. So that brings us, I think, to some Q&A. Fantastic. Yeah, Thank you very much, there. Chris. Thank you so much. It's uh, I know we've discussed it before, but it's a, it's a fascinating journey that you guys have been on there and uh, lots of, of facets to that. And of course, we've had some questions from the audience. So, you know, happy to fire them off at you as, as they've come in. So the first question we have here, um, uh, is the branding done through product owners or is this through a separate group? It's done from product owners, but what we do is we work with them along with our marketing team um, because there's there's templates and color palettes that the marketing team has, has designed specifically for the health system. So we connect them and make sure that we enable that collaboration to, to happen. And once they finalize the output, we uh, we provide a, a landing spot for them and we help them to build, we basically walk them through the process that they attach that as a banner, uh, either in the header or could be in the quarter as you see in the, the slide that's up there, the brand is in the lower left corner. Uh, well, we work with them based on what the, the tool is to help them to, to do that. Um, but once we get them started, they're usually able to they manage that. Fantastic. Um, the, the next question, uh, one that you'd probably expect when talking about uh, self-service, but um, are you seeing challenges with uh, data quality uh, and the consistency of, of results through the allowance of self-service? And if so, you know, how are you addressing that? That's a great question. And the answer to that, of course, is yes, there's some of that. I think when you enable self-service, it's kind of a, a byproduct of that, at least in the early stages. But I think it's much harder to govern with the iron fist <laughs> um, than it is to enable people and, and, and collaborate with them. So as they are starting to, to work, one of the things that we try to do is, you know, let them know that before you're promoting things to production, if it's going to be shared beyond all work group, let's, process with, let's take a look at a couple of different things. We want to understand the content, make sure everything's on dashboard and it's an art unto itself. So if I have to explain the joke, it wasn't funny. If I have to explain the visualization, it's probably not quite right. So, you know, just working with them, collaborating and supporting them um, and helping them to make sure that their data models are really producing what they're looking for. And we try to make sure we're also connecting them to SMEs if, you know, if there's a data owner in the organization that's not part of the conversation. So we're making those things happen for them. Not always easy, but, you know, they're, they're easily solvable if we position ourselves as a service as opposed to try to smack people around and stop them from doing what they have to do to do their jobs. Absolutely. Um, uh, the questions uh, keep coming in, so I'll, I'll keep firing them off. Um, so we, uh, sure. the next question um, is, is, how do you share analytics broadly internally? Is there an internal community way of sharing? Um, or is that formal or informal? How does that dynamic work? It's actually a combination of both. Um, again, we're not forcing people to use everything that we do, um, but we, we offer within our, uh, our portal uh, landing spots for the different parts of the organization. Some of the tabs we have in there highlight the function and responsibility of each of the different groups that do analytics. Uh, they show that they really profile the leader that they should work with if they want some support in that area. Um, they're, they're able to publish the content that they want to within our portal. Uh, again, we've provided some framework that enables them to do things that would be much harder for them to go through the process and do both from a funding perspective and potentially also from a skill set perspective. Web publishing is very different than uh, dashboarding, for example. Generally speaking, a lot of people have the same skill sets, but 
it's, it's not always easy to accomplish both. Fantastic. And then I guess moving on actually to the, the, the outcome side of thing, one of the questions we have here is um, how is your department um, and also the departments that you work with um, using patient experience data to make actual change and improvements to the, the patient experience throughout their journey through the entire healthcare system? I love that question. Uh, so part of what we did in, in enabling the group to do the visualizations that I showed you um, was to collaborate with them on the, the management of the data asset itself and the building of the models, and then collaborated with the leadership team to steer them towards the use of the tools that we were providing so that they can determine which are the measures that we're gonna focus on for any particular point in time. And this is also, also feeds into the CMS star ratings program as well. So it helps us to understand where the things we need to improve we're, out, we're actually looking at ways now to integrate some of those feedback mechanisms into the communication in more real time so that if someone's had a bad experience and we know that they're presenting at one of our sites, which we know we have some work to do to, to improve that experience. Um, but the, the group that we're interacting with falls under the chief experience officer of the health system, which is a fantastic part of our organization. Their whole focus is trying to look at everything through the lens of the patient. Uh, they do walkthroughs at all of our facilities with our executive teams, examining noise levels, uh, signage, uh, every possible way that the, the patient's interacting with us to try to make some improvements there. And we have direct patient involvement in one of our, our initiatives now, it's called our digital patient experience. Um, some patients that have given us feedback or are actually part of the process and design of some of the things that we're developing to improve that with our mobile applications. Fantastic. I know we had uh, some conversations around this yesterday, actually, with, with Tim Carey's presentation. Uh, and it's fascinating how these these very incremental changes to a patient experience go a long way. Uh, and it's the very small human touches that, that really sort of play yes. a role in, in this stuff. It's, it, it, it is very fascinating. Um, the next question uh, ties in quite nicely, actually, to our session that's coming up. But um, this question reads, excellent presentation. Uh, is your organization planning to leverage your data using AI and advanced machine learning techniques? That's another great question. Yes, and there's, a, there's quite a lot of that going on, as you can imagine. Uh, our data science team under our research division is going day and night right now. Uh, as you can well imagine, we have one of the largest data sets available to us. Uh, on this, in the current COVID situation, for example, um, of any health system in the country, we've treated more, more COVID cases than any other health system. Um, it's hard to get quality data um, on large scale um, without uh, the, the questions around the quality and completeness of it. So having this particular event, while horrific, it's, an enable, it's enabling the leveraging of this technology with purpose and it's got the support of the whole of our whole organization but we're getting a lot of um, requests from government agencies as well to really help gain insight into the, this whole thing we, there's still so much we don't know about it um, so the, the research guys are in data science teams as i'm told roughly about 125 of them um, that are using every technology under the sun <laughs> to really gain insight to, that we can uh, really help to understand the, the nature of this thing and, and how it's evolving. Um, it, it's evolving in real time and we, have, we, we just don't, we can't keep up with it um, in terms of understanding what's to come. So we're looking at that, we're doing a, a fair amount of focus on, you know, how do we understand sooner that something is about to hit. Um, I, I, well, I can't really go into too much of um, that, but we're, we're looking at some potential leading indicators that will help us to be much more proactive in planning and staffing. For example, um, maybe not being surprised that we have to start you know, adding 200 beds on the fly uh, during a, a crazy surge level that we're experiencing. Um, it, it seems that uh, the, the patient uh, data question struck a chord. We've actually had a follow-up question to that. Um, mm -hmm. What mobile apps are you using to collect the, the patient data? I guess, what's your, what's your methodology there? So there is a, there's a homegrown uh, app that we're using. Uh, when I say homegrown, we've done it with collaboration with, with some, some vendor partners. Um, this, 
I'm, I'm not even sure what they're calling it, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but the whole initiative is it's called DPX, we call it. It's the, the digital patient experience, and it's really focused on uh, delivering um, mobile tools that, that are enabling that. Um, there's, we have um, we have one the credit, the pre, was it? I'm trying to recall where it was. Um, the, the, there was an app that we call Follow My Health that was first enabled on, on mobile. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's available in the App Store. It's easy to find. I know the one that we're working on is also available. I have to follow up on that. I, I don't have it right in front of no problem at all. Not a problem. Um, going back to to the sort of the COVID nineteen uh, conversation point, we actually had a question around that. Uh, I know you've mm. you've touched on it a little bit, but um, you know, how have you? Well, how has COVID nineteen impacted your team and I guess your wider strategy? Um, and what impact do you think it will have going forward? You know, how how has this altered your path? It's dramatically impacted us. Um, I went from trying to figure out how many roles and functions within my organization um, could be remote to actually having everybody re be remote instantly happened overnight. Um, so I learned a lot about my assumptions and most of them were incorrect. Um, my teams are working very, very effectively remotely. Um, it's certainly been challenging, but having you know the, the technologies that are enabling the collaboration, um, one of the ones that we're using is Microsoft Teams. Uh, we're probably more connected and communicating more effectively together now than ever. I have daily check-ins with all of my leadership team. I do drop-ins to most of the staff meetings. Uh, have a chance to be face-to-face -face with them virtually, even more so than I have when I was in the office and going all, all over the place to meetings. Um, but it's really also impacting the way that we collaborate across the organization. Um, in the last several weeks, I have become extremely well acquainted with the majority of our leadership team and been on you know web calls with them in real time, working on interfaces. And, and moving data into position for us uh, on the fly with the VP on the phone, giving their developers permission to add data to the feeds that we're getting um, to really be able to proactively uh, get things out there that typically would have taken us months of, of work just to get approvals to do. Uh, so unbelievable improvements to the, the collaboration level and the pace that we are doing agile development. I think we're doing agile on steroids right now. <laughs> um, the, the agile on steroids. I like that. That's a good soundbite <laughs> from today's event. <laughs> um, one of the questions um, that we had come through, actually, uh, we've had two questions very similar um, around the sort of stakeholder management side of things. I know you spoke about executive buy-in um, and you know demonstrating that ROI, but um, a couple of questions here about you know, how does your uh, analytics resource center interact with with the business units, and I guess. Um, what challenges did you have there initially? How did it impact the business? How did you overcome that sort of stakeholder management piece? So the, the first thing that I did is I really had I, I had some um, lengthy conversations with a couple of our key leaders. Uh, one of the gentlemen that I report uh, into, um, in addition to the CIO, was also the executive vice president for strategy and analytics, and you know really made sure that they understood what I was what I was um, aiming to do. Um, and really talked it through with those two initially and then a handful of the other uh, health system leaders so that they understood that we we're trying to, to improve visibility and access to information, but also give them better visibility into what's happening with the analytics across the organization so that they, that they could start to promote that as a service. And so in our launch, what we, we did is we did a high level overview of analytics not only that my team's producing, but other analytic teams are producing. We co-presented to some of the leadership to let them see exactly what the capabilities are across the organization. And we asked for their help in promoting uh, the, the utilization of the platform. And so there's a, a few different executive leadership levels that we went and did a, a presentation and overview to with the punchline being, here's the website, we encourage you to, to Send this all over the place. Tell your people to go ahead and use it. If you have questions, uh, here's where you can get your answers. And we took responsibility for doing doing the connect, connection between the different business units. So if they come to our analytic resource center and they're asking a question about uh, length of stay or they're looking for revenue cycle information, we're connecting them directly to the person who can answer the question as opposed to them trying to go through a directory and figure out who do I call. So it's, it's gone very well in that regard. 
Um, but again, it wasn't a forced model. Um, we're, we're promoting it. Uh, you got to be careful how fast you promote certain things because you know if you if you go too fast, people are going to get frustrated. You can't provide all the services they want. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a balance. But the, the more people are engaged in, in supporting it um, up front, the, the better. And I find that the best uh, the best support we get is from the business units that we're enabling and giving them access to to utilize it in ways that sort really support their needs. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I think we're probably just about out of time um, to move on to our, our next panel discussion. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the audience as well for the fantastic questions. Uh, and Chris, I hope we're not speaking out of turn here, but of course, always happy to connect on LinkedIn with anybody who wants to carry on the conversation and, you know, just be connected, uh, especially at the moment. Uh, I know the data analytics community are, are coming together quite nicely, especially in healthcare. So, Chris, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, all the best. Thank you all. Be well. Please do reach out. Fantastic.